Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks today. I'm so excited today to be joined by the wonderful Tom Meissen to talk all about the Apple TV Plus series, C. And the first thing that I wanted to talk about is this is a television show that has built such an extensively detailed world in terms of production design, in terms of story, narrative arcs, and who these characters are and how they interact with each other. Um, very heavy heavy politics and interpersonal drama between them all. And so in joining a show like this in the second season, as you were looking at previous episodes, what were the most important details for you to start honing in on and keying into in order to figure out who your character was and how he was going to tessellate into this already existing world? Um, I was really lucky that they built such a clear world beforehand. It made it very easy for me to come in as a, a newcomer. Often you know, when you, when you come into something, you don't know where your place will be within it. But because they'd created such a clear world and I went in knowing who the characters are and the actors are, are great and were very welcoming, but it meant there was something to aim for if I knew that uh, Harlan had to bash heads with someone or form more intimate relationships with someone else. I kind of knew where I, as a performer, would go, to, would would aim for to to get what the character wants. Um, it was also very helpful that this the city that um, Harlan runs, Penta, is a new city. So although we have the the scope of the world, the first season was definitely far more rural, and it was up in the mountains and the beautiful forests of uh, of Vancouver Island. And now we're shooting in Toronto, and so we build cities, and they've got um, Trivanti's, which is really industrial, and then my place, which is uh, a huge kind of semi-rural in the ruins of what was once Penn State University. So although the world was created, I was able to create my world, which was my city. And really, when uh, Queen Kane and her sister Margaret come into my city, they're the newcomers. So we both kind of, kind of came at it fresh. Uh, but yeah, all of the work that had gone in before, it was nice to just jump onto a, a, the train that was already moving down the tracks at quite a nice pace. I also love the way in which you always describe your character development process and say that one of the most exciting elements of that for you is finding all of the details off of the page and looking at a character like Lord Harlan in this show. What were the spaces beyond the scripts that you had that you found yourself diving into researching or really developing in terms of his backstory and history the most? I think with with Harlan, it it really, really was once I started working with Hera, who plays Margaret, and Sylvia, who plays the Queen, especially those two, um, that was where the, the fun stuff off the page came. Um, when I started the first you know, few weeks, it was just me and Hera doing our stuff together. And she is so brilliant at uh, wanting to explore how the characters know each other, where where the scene moves, where we want an episode to move and how the scene and individual moments within the scene all piece together, um, which is a really, really fun thing to discuss, especially as as we said, when it's a newcomer coming into a, a formed world to, to chat so that we're both on the same page is really great. And it's not something that happens very often. Actors always have their, their own different approaches. And so not everyone wants to sit and chat. But with us, because it's such an extraordinary, um, fantastical world, we were able to really mine into it and find our places. Now that then adds to uh, how we interact with each other without the dialogue, which was so important with this because all of the characters are, are blind. So it's a way of, we can show a lot more to the audience without worrying that the other characters would see. So we can actually, it's quite freeing because we can, we can really express what's going on inside without having to put uh, the, the physical lid on it to try and keep it secret from the other characters. Um, that's really where where the off the page stuff came from, from working with, with them a lot. 
There's uh, also a, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 please, please. There's also a lot of details very early on, even in that first episode, where there's other characters talking about Harlan as well. And so we get a keyed in sense of who he is from the things that other people are saying about him as well. Like the queen talking about, well, I don't know how he rose to power, but I'm sure it wasn't by you know above board means. And, and the fact that she's also talking about if he sees an opportunity for himself, you know, he's always gonna take it. So did you find that, that the scripts were giving you a lot of details through the other characters in terms of who he was as well? Yes, always. I think, um, you know, at least 50% of what you know about when you're finding out about your character is what, other characters saying about them. Um, it also, it does most of the job for me. So I don't have to try and pretend to be clever if the other characters are saying that Harlan is clever or if Harlan is, if people are suspicious and they're talking about how suspicious he is, it means I don't have to go around and twist my moustache and be all baddie acting. Instead, I can focus on uh, his humor or him trying to flirt with someone um, yeah, they, they do a lot of the job for me, so it's easy. I don't have to do anything. <laughs> there's, also, there's also lines that he delivers in terms of talking about his ancestry and his family and, and the fact that his family have always been serving at the feet of monarchy, but they've kind of never managed to rise above their station for themselves, and that being something that feels like it's very important to him. And so how did you shape that aspect in terms of thinking about his family, the way that he's looked at his ancestors and what it is that he really wants for himself out of everything that he's trying to manipulate? I think that was a really nice moment. I was really pleased that that was in the script because so much of him is loving the fact that he has the, the power. And even when um, the queen comes in and tries to uh, reduce his power, he can still enjoy the games and can still enjoy trying to keep it. And I could play that knowing that there will be a scene revealing the bitterness behind it that he came from nothing. And even though he, spoiler alert, marries into the royal family because it helps him, from a very young age, he despised the royal family because he knew the people who had to scurry around behind them and try and clear up their messes and just any anything that the royal family will throw down to them, they'll have to grasp hold of it in order to survive. And that was a low lying bitterness for him. Um, which again, it means you don't have to play all of the time. So when Harlan is trying to worm his way into the royal family, um, I don't need to then add on the layer of bitterness, which would muddy the, the waters a bit. Yeah. And half the fun in watching him in these first few episodes as well is that it's not always entirely clear what his intentions are. So if we take the scene where he gives Margaret the sound bar and he's like, well, I remember that you loved playing with these when you were a kid. There's potential that it really is just a sentimental connection, but there's also potential that he's really using it as a moment of opportunity for himself to kind of get in with her a little bit more in a, in a specific way so that he can capitalize on it later. And so when you're working with the scripts, does that give you a lot of delicious playfulness in the way that you're really able to subvert expectations and really think about all the different possibilities of intention with him as a character? Yeah, it's always fun to play as many as you can at once. Um, so taking that moment, for example, he wants to form a, a connection with Margaret because he would like to keep his city and he knows that she's easier than the queen to to get to know and you know to get on his side but equally there's a history where he has always been in love with her ever since they were they were kids and that's something that Hera and I had discussed a lot and it's something that will come up later on then there is the another level that I just decided to throw in was he's just always hated those sound things it just makes such an annoying noise for him. But for Margaret, he'll have to do it. Just as many layers as, as possible is always much more fun. And there was lots of, lots of room in this. I think so many of the scenes were suitably um, ambiguous that it really, the writers really let us go and explore. And um, Anders, our director who directed 
most of the episodes really wanted to try and explore that and find as many different avenues and then make all of the avenues meet up and that's how you get to more thorough interesting characters yeah and and obviously one of one of the main aspects of the story is that this is in an entire community and world where everybody's been blind for hundreds of years so it's not the case of of a blind community existing in a seeing world it's it's a community that have adapted the world that they live in to themselves and so in terms of a lot of the production details and the way that locations are even just spaced out and set up what are some of the details that you found that really represented that aspect and, and that telling of the story in that way? So the one that I, I loved when I watched season one was the, the wires through the streets so that people just find their ways just by reaching up with their staffs and touching and they can, it's like a, a road map. And I loved that. I thought that was such a brilliant idea. And of course, because it's it's the world that had existed for hundreds of years, you don't make a big thing out of it because it's not a big thing for the inhabitants. It's just what you do. You go in and you tap. And equally, when Baba Voss in this season goes back to Trevantes for the first time in however long it's been, he finds his way. He just taps up and finds his way. And that was the detail when I first watched it that, that completely hooked me. Um, starting working in it, um, Joe Streche, who's our uh, blindness consultant, um, who's amazing, had spoken with the costume department a lot about things that can be fiddled with. He said that uh, these characters can use uh, touch on their own bodies, on their costumes, to reveal a lot. Um, so working with Natalie, our costume designer, was particularly helpful. That some of the, when Harlan is wearing something that he wants to feel powerful, he wears something heavier and it just, you know, settles him in. When there are moments that I want to show a little bit of um, uh, either curiosity or nervousness with Harlan, we have fiddly things that you can just fiddle with. Um, that's been particularly interesting and particularly helpful in this world that I would never think about in any other show. I would never, ever say, oh, could I have a little something so that I can just stand there and fiddle around with a little brooch or something? It would just be ridiculous, but it kind of works in this, which is nice. Is that part of the reason behind the detailing in his hair as well? Because there's almost like a little individual <laughs> braid that hangs down, but it's not just hair. There's like little trinkets inside of it as well. So it looks like a really sensory item on screen. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly it. Um, I don't think I have ever, I've never really played with it on screen, but I think it's definitely there to have been played with. I just left that little rat tail well alone. <laughs> I also wanted to talk about working with Joe Streche in terms of echolocation, because that's a big thing that's utilized in the show, in that we see characters come into rooms and the act of kind of stepping your foot onto the ground is a way to map out the space of the room where the walls are. And there's a lot of kind of clicks and whistles and elements like that as well. And so how have you really pulled that into your character and utilized it at the beginning of scenes and locations as he's mapping out and navigating spaces? Um yeah, before we started shooting, I went out a couple of weeks early to do work with Joe and he's got a team of movement people. Um, and that was one of the first things that we started talking about was the echolocation, which is something that I was completely unfamiliar with, uh, but he uses all the time. Um, and it's quite extraordinary how the more used to it you get, the more you really can if if you, close, if you cover your eyes and walk into a room and give one of those clicks, you can tell whether how big the room is. You can tell where things are. I went to um, uh, a party with him, with Joe, a while ago, and we, we walked into the room and he gave a couple of clicks uh, and just went, oh, I'm, I'm going to go over there and get a drink. Because he walked in, clicked, could tell where a crowd of people are, well, usually they crowd around where the drinks are, so that's where he'll go and get a drink. And it just completely blew my mind. 
Um, and yeah, that's particularly important in this. And I've loved that. It's something that I loved watching, especially in the, the action sequences where Jason uses his sword, rubbing the sword on the floor, or they throw something, not only to get the attention of the people you're fighting, but also to get a sense of location. And it's really intelligently used, I think. Yeah. And and off the back of the idea of sensory details on, on costumes as well, there's also that idea of tacitness with touch between characters as well so if we take the moment where Harlan comes into the bathroom while the queen is taking a bath and then they're having a conversation where they're trying to one-up each other and there's a real physical closeness between the two of you as you're having that conversation there's kind of like a touch on the shoulder and so there's a real, real utilization of that as part of the conversation and part of the the dialogue that they're having with each other and the way that they're trying to play each other in that scene and so have you found that you've really started to utilize that a lot more in terms of interactions with characters in different ways as well Oh, definitely. There's the added layer with the Queen that she's the Queen and no one is allowed to touch her. Uh, so actually in the first episode, I give her a little give her a little bump on the shoulder just because I'm testing the ground and I want to wind her up. And that's never happened to her in her life. And the, coming in and she's in the bath and just flicking a little bit of water at her face, that's never happened. And that's Harlan you know, um, pushing the bound like a stupid child who just wants to test the boundaries until he is executed, uh, and then he'll know he's gone too far. Um, yes, we. It's something that Anders, the director, um, always wanted to work with because it's, it's something completely unique to see is having that uh, intimacy, the closeness, which isn't weird for someone who's blind. It doesn't seem weird if you're right up next to each other, but it does allow the camera to pick up a completely unique angle where it's all about ears. And so you, people can be really close and talking in, directly into each other's ears. And it doesn't seem just like they're whispering secrets. It just means like they're, they're closer. That was really helpful with, uh, with Hera who plays Margaret when you want to get a sense of intimacy and not only sexual intimacy, but uh, closeness and trust in their friendship as the show goes on. Um, with the Queen, it's something completely different. It's them trying to threaten each other, but you get all of that just from the proximity, which I just love. And some of the shots, um, some of them have made it into the, the edit, but of just, you know, when something would happen off screen and a sighted character would turn to look, instead, a, a, a character without sight would turn their ear towards it. And so immediately you get an image that you don't really get anywhere else. And it's really exciting. And um, I think it all looks beautiful. And that idea of pushing boundaries and testing other people's boundaries also just seems like Harlan to a T because I know that you've said that having him as a character be able to wind up Jason Momoa's character has been one of the most joyful elements of working on the show for you as well. And and But also when we look at it from, from a character strategy point as well, it's the idea that, you know, he's in Harlan's land and in his space. So Harlan almost has this, this sense of security. And so did you find that you had an idea of where the line would be of how far he could push it, but then also finding the space where he could push it a little bit further with that in mind as well? I think he knows exactly where the line is with everyone, but you know, sod it, he's gonna do it anyway. Um, I think it's the only power that he has with the queen taking over, the only power he has is the power to absolutely annoy the piss out of everyone. And so, um, you know, the queen and Bubba, they come from their different worlds into Harlan's and any of their, you know, their um, one-upmanship with him, it doesn't wash here. It doesn't mean anything because if you want to achieve anything in Penza, you have to have Harlan on side because Harlan's the only one who can get the people of Penta on side. And that's something that through the episodes, it really uh, becomes more apparent that people 
need him. And the more the other characters realize that, and the more Harlan realizes they realize that, the more he can push it. I think if he could choose how to die, it would be having uh, Jason Momoa smash his face in. <laughs> I'm almost surprised no one has- And I'm the same, uh, that's, for, that's for Tom as well. If I could choose how I die, I'd be smothered by Jason. <laughs> the writers are like, great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then I also wanted to talk a little bit about the stunt work in the show, because you're playing a character who doesn't come across as a natural fighter, that he really, you know, is quite verbally whip smart and uses that a lot of times, um, but also isn't afraid to step into the physicality when he needs to either. And with the stunt work, because so much of that is often really paying attention and keying into and watching all of the different motions and details when you're in the midst of a scene like that, how did you have to reconfigure and restructure how you were learning stunt movements and motions given that obviously you can't be paying attention and, and moving around to all of the movement that's happening right in front of you and in interactions it was it was it was so great I, I I always really enjoyed doing the doing fight scenes and stuff like that so when it came to it with this it was just doing it in a completely different way that I'd never done before because always I'd been taught when you you know if you're gonna go and hit someone and they'd hit or swing something at someone you should probably check that they're ready. And usually you try and clock it, a little bit of eye contact before something comes in. But with this, of course, you couldn't. So we had to work a lot together to make sure that we were, it's like doing a dance, um, that we're completely in sync with each other. Um, and again, like I said earlier about listening rather than seeing, you kind of try to listen for their movements, which is, I don't know, it's, it's, uh, I sound incredibly wanky talking about it, but you do have to kind of work in this um, complicity that you don't have before. And the stunt team are, ju are just amazing. Um, you only need to see the work that they did, that they've done before to know that. Um, yeah, Harlan doesn't have a great deal of fighting because he hasn't needed to for a while. I imagine that when he was younger and scrapping about being a scavenger, he got into scrapes, but he talks his way out of it most of the time. Um, there's one very exciting secret of his that we were going to reveal in this season, but actually we thought we'd save it um, until it comes in about halfway through season three, you see the secret. And it then a lot of the stuff in season two, why he is so calm about everything kind of makes sense. Interesting. So that's something... You're going to make us wait all that time to find out. <laughs> yeah. Who knows when season three will come out, but you know, in, in nine years time, you'll look back and think, wow, Tom was right. There's the secret. <laughs> like there it is. <laughs> yeah. Finally. And overall, in the way that you're working with your scene partners in this, has it forced you to think very differently about the connectivity and the dynamic, you know, even going back to what you were saying before about having conversations and that physical closeness and intimacy, because you know, usually a lot of that is, is also eye contact and that's a physical element that you can't rely on at all. And so for you, has it really transformed the way in which you think about working with scene partners overall because of the different ways that you've had to approach scenes? Yeah. It just seems, uh, there was someone on set a while ago who said um, it just it feels rude not looking at an, another actor because, you know, you talk to each other. Even right now, I, you know, even though we're however many thousand miles away, I'm looking at you on the screen and I, I have to. Otherwise, it, it's manners. Sorry, you know, uh, <laughs> growing up in sorry. That's, uh, um, but yeah, it's the most natural thing when you're talking to someone, you, you make eye contact with them and that was really difficult to to get used to not looking at someone especially when they they comment and uh, something they say affects you that's the first thing you do is is turn to them or i i'm very fond of a saucy look uh, so a little fruity look from tom myson uh, which usually gets cut um i couldn't even attempt in this and hand gestures i just i'm an idiot and i use my hands a lot um but that was one of the first things that that joe said when we were doing our sessions was 
nodding, shaking your head, hand gestures, all completely redundant in a world without sight. So that, that, that's also why I was grateful for something to hold it. And the staff and having this, it, it means I, I don't gesture so much. Because Joe and his movement team are always sitting behind a monitor. And they're relaying to him every action that is done. And then he comes in after each take and says, Tom, you, you don't shake your head. Don't shake your head. Don't do your, your gesture. When I talk about going somewhere and I pointed it, do, what, why are you, what are you pointing for? No one can see you pointing, you idiot. Um, so that was probably the hardest thing to get to grips with, uh, which is controlling my body. I can't control my body, is basically what I'm saying. <laughs> I am pathetic, <laughs> and I admit it. I also feel like Harlan would have had so many fruity looks in this show as well. So the fact that oh, you found other ways of expressing that is really fantastic. Thank God. Thank God he can't see. He'd be winking all over the shop. Well, I can't wait to see in the second half of season three why so many things have been the way that they have for him as yeah, a character. Right. Thank you so much for, for sharing all of this detail and working on the show with us, Tom. Really appreciate yeah. it. Thanks for having me.